Hi, my name is Dan Barron. I'm the Tech Service Director for New Farm, and I'm joined today by my counterpart, Jason Fossey. And today we're going to be talking about Tradewind Aquatic Herbicide and kind of walking through the chemistry uh, on this product is uh, a person who has a lot of expertise in this arena and was around while Tradewind was developed. So, Jason, welcome. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and we'll jump into Tradewind. Well, thank you, Dan, and uh, appreciate that introduction. Yeah, uh, Tradewind is a product that I've had a lot of experience with. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to visiting with you today and visiting with the group on some of the information that we've really generated throughout the years with Tradewind. Uh, everything from some, some background on terrestrial uses as well as the aquatics uses to really, I think, kind of understand and uh, kind of determine the fit for this product in, in aquatics. Well, fantastic. Well, in this whole world of aquatic herbicides, you know, one of the things that I've always found is this aquatic business is very technical. So we're going to take a little bit of liberty and do a chemistry overview on Tradewind, which, you know, kind of is the building blocks of how we understand how the product works, where it fits, and its utility in these unique aquatic environments. So, Jason, why don't you talk to us a little bit about the active ingredient in trade wind and how that manifests, how it behaves in aquatic environments. Yeah, we'll jump right into to bisparabac sodium is the active ingredient in trade wind. And uh, uh, just to give everybody a background, you know, this is an ALS inhibitor. Now, most of us are probably familiar with the term ALS, and it's really just kind of a fancy term, right? For the most part, it's, it's a type of chemistry uh, where it stops three branch chain amino acids from being produced in the plant. So one of the things to keep in mind when you're talking about this type of chemistry, plants normally will have some of these uh, amino acids built up. So what you're doing when you make an application of one of these herbicides, uh, you're preventing new amino acids from being produced, but ultimately then you're starving out the plant. So they're not Im immediate right after the application, but eventually you'll start to see where there's some selectivity and then plants that really ultimately can't tolerate these products uh, will eventually fade away. And you'll see that trade win is one of these three different subclasses. So that's one of the things to keep in mind. Yes, it's an ALS inhibitor, but there are differences certainly among these products, which are certainly um, Clearcast and Galleon are, are two other common aquatic herbicides that you'll find that, that kind of fit in this category. And with bisparabac, one of the really unique things is that it is very long lasting. You'll find half-lives in water for what I'd say is a minimum of 30 days, but more, more times than not, you'll find half-lives in that range of a lot of times two months. So these, this is overall a long-lasting and persistent product that's really broken down by microbial activity. Um, if you go into the next slide then, Dan, I think what's interesting about this, again, ALS chemistries, but these herbicides in clear cast gallion and trade wind are, are very, very different. You can see structurally they're quite different, but you'll find that when you really start to break them down, that the spectrum is different. Uh, you know, how the plants respond to each of these is very different and really how they're metabolized by the plants and in water is quite unique. So there's some pretty large differences and we're gonna show you some pictures on, on some of these differences, Dan. Yeah, and one of the things about ALS herbicides, as you mentioned, uh, you know, there's a lot of products, both uh, terrestrial ag herbicides have been developed, but uh, certainly, as you mentioned, in this aquatic arena, one of the things that I've always thought is that they're, they're so unique. They have widely different uh, types of selectivity. And uh, when we think about the uh, aquatic environment, they have a very favorable uh, toxicology profile as well. And so that's why they've been really popular, be it in uh, traditional uh, terrestrial ag environments or in aquatic as well. And so that's one of the nice things about having uh, this category of chemistry in trade wind. So let's talk a little bit about the environmental fate of, of bisparabac, the active ingredient in trade wind, and, and how that uh, manifests itself in aquatic environments. Yeah, I mean, like you said, one of the great things about trade wind, I mean, if I had to sit down and draw up some characteristics, I think, you know, Trade one would def definitely check the boxes on certain categories, right? If you look at the first one and foremost, how about persistence in the soil, right? Do we have to worry about if this thing gets into some muck or, or along shorelines or if it gets blown up onto the shore, what, what could happen in this situation? But overall, the half-life once trade wind is, is, comes in contact with soil is extremely short. You see two days is the half-life and a lot of times it can even be less than that. So we're talking about a product that really, really degrades quickly once it comes in contact with soil. 
Um, its half-life in the plant, though, interestingly enough, is fairly long. Uh, once it's in the plant, a lot of times we'll see plants that a half-life of, of 30 days. So we'll continue to work in that plant even after a single, single exposure. So I think that's something that we can start to build on is that once it gets into the plant, it can work in that plant for a, a long period of time. But then also more importantly, like I talked about the half-life in water, pretty long. A lot of times at least two months. And again, we'll show some data later in the presentation, but you know, a fairly persistent product in the water, very, very short-lived in soil and in the plant. It's kind of mediocre to actually last last for quite a while once it's in the in the plant itself. So Dan, you know, some really nice characteristics we can take advantage of for, for use in aquatics. Absolutely. Um, you know, with that ALS activity, in contrast to some other chemistries, as you mentioned, it's, it's basically shutting down the plant's ability to produce those key amino acids. So uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the speed of activity on some of the key weeds, specifically hydrilla and others, as, as we've seen in, in the testing and commercialization of tra trade wind. Yeah, one of the things that you're going to find is that making applications of trade wind some of the speed of activity that you're going to find, it, it will be variable. Uh, it's interesting. What we have seen is a strong correlation between warmer temperatures. So when it's bright, sunny, fairly shallow water that's pretty warm, you will have faster activity with trade wind. And, and that's what's noted here. A lot of times you'll see within days of the application, uh, some pretty strong activity. Uh, other times under really cool conditions, say even in the state of Florida and some of our early work, if you do it in the middle of winter when days are, are pretty short, uh, water temperatures are down. Uh, we found in times where it might be four months after that initial application until you really see peak activity, especially on hydrilla. So that's one thing, it is somewhat variable depending on the target weed and depending on the temperature. But the, again, I think the neat thing about this has been the consistency of the results and some of the selectivity. Uh, Dan, we're, we're gonna jump into this, but uh, I think that's another area that really starts to separate trade wind as an ALS inhibitor from some of the other products really on the marketplace is the selectivity that it provides. And, and again, the dissipation in the water column, um, I mean, there's some exceptions, but again, a long lasting chemistry uh, that when it comes into in contact with various plants, uh, some have the ability to metabolize it, some don't, and it really has some nice selectivity that 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 leads us to. Yeah, and that really speaks to the selective nature of the chemistry. If uh, there's slow dissipation, one might assume that you would have more broad spectrum and maybe start impacting the the non-target species. So it really does speak to the selectivity. So that'll be interesting as we go on throughout the presentation here today to kind of touch on some of the, the findings in these applications. So we're going to shift gears here now. We've kind of touched on the chemistry, and we're going to discuss kind of the efficacy and selectivity. The, the key things that aquatic plant managers are looking for is how can we uh, use a tool like Tradewind to target the, the nuisance species without uh, impacting the desirables. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, kind of the labeled weeds that we know we're, we're active on with trade wind and, and the submersed as well. So we've got a list here, Jason, maybe walk through a few of these and some of your observations on these floating and emergent weeds. Yeah, so the first thing I'll mention is when we take a look here at, at trade wind on some of these uh, floating and emergent weeds, uh, I'll start with some of the floating weeds, things like duckweed, mosquito fern, uh, water, water lettuce, you know, these are key weeds that trade wind has really strong activity on. Uh, like you were saying, they just don't have the ability to overcome much of an exposure. They get, the herbicide gets pulled into the plant, really doesn't have a great way to metabolize it. What we find is that use rates between one and two ounces, so this is a dry product, so one and two ounces per surface acre is enough to control some of these really common weeds um, that are floating and as well as some, some emergent weeds that really are quite common in, in aquatic settings as well. Yeah, so on these, Jason, you're talking about a broadcast spray as opposed to a, a submerged application, is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And one of the things, Dan, that we have found that is important is a surfactant. Um, you know, adding a surfactant, we can, you know, 
jump into more details on that at another time, but it is important to add a surfactant. We're at a low amount of, of product here. We want to try to get as good a coverage at application as we can, and then we can get really good control of all these weeds that are listed on, on this slide. Fantastic. All right, well, let's move below water. We've got three key weeds that we'll, uh, that we'll focus with on trade wind. Talk a little bit about the the, these guys and, and what you've seen in, during the development over the years during commercialization of Tradewind? Well, certainly when it comes to the aquatic business, three really important weeds. One, hydrilla. Uh, really, that was where we first uh, decided to, to take Tradewind into the aquatics market was because of the activity that it provided on hydrilla. Uh, even topped out material, uh, we could go into some really difficult situations and with a material that has the ability to kind of get completely spread out throughout the water column, last for a long period of time in the water column. It's really important, uh, some characteristics to try to control a weed like hydrilla that, you know, you have to have some flexibility in there. You can't always get this weed when it's just starting to emerge and barely in the in the water column. So uh, sago pond weed is another one. A lot of times we'll find this in a little bit of moving water to a certain extent, uh, but a really common pond weed, as well as Eurasian water milfoil, really a lot of places uh, kind of found throughout the country. Uh, again, a submersed weed that you make a single application uh, somewhere, you know, and we'll talk some about rates, but a lot of times I like to see these at 30 to 45 part per billion. So again, a very low rate concentration, at least to start with, single application and, and really attack some of these weeds. Oh, fantastic. Well, one of the interesting things about trade wind and, and the selectivity component, well, let's talk a little bit about kind of the journey during uh, the development of trade wind and some of the findings that that uh, that you were uh, a part of as this product was being developed, Jason. Yeah, this was the, always a fun part for me as a research guy, right? You get excited when we were, we're starting with all new chemistry we didn't know much about besides, you know, this is an ALS inhibitor, use some in rice, but, you know, how is this going to really work in aquatics? So we did a lot of mesocosm work, especially with the uh, Army Corps engineers, and really started to compare it to some of the other products that are on the market. So, uh, Dan, I think the next slide when you jump into it, you know, this is just a really good example of some of the differences that you find from, from some chemistries that are pretty similar. But what we did was in these mesocosm trials started with a static concentration. So you would put a, a concentration of trade one between 15, well, we had 15 and 30 part per million, so two different rates, and then evaluated it on um, spatter docks or a new far, as well as two different water lilies, fragrant water lily, Mexican water lily, um, and then evaluated it for 12 weeks. So left it in the solution for a week, pulled it out, put it in fresh water for the next 11 weeks, and then just really compared some of these products. And, and what we started with was that all three of these species, uh, sort of like in the top left picture here, um, all three of these species are in these containers. And you can see the trade went at 30 part per billion, what that looked like after this trial, in that it removed both the water lily species, but in this case, the NUFAR, the spatter dock, was still remaining versus sonar, uh, another material you think of, long persistence within the water column, removed everything. Uh, and Galleon um, selectivity kind of flip-flopped here where the new the new farm was removed, but the Mexican water lily remained. So you can see really big differences, you know, depending on which species we're talking about within these three different chemistries here. So Dan, it, you know, it really was an important part to try to figure out of, of where we were going. And that really took us to this next part, Dan, which you might want to make a, a couple of comments on, on this slide. Uh, some of your yeah. some of your take home on this one yeah so you know over the years during you know the the uh, exemption permits during development the lab work as well as over the years during the commercial development of trade when you start to build a pretty good uh catalog catalog or library of, of desirable non-target plant response and now here we're talking about uh the subsurface applications and kind of that 30 to 45 part per billion range and, and over the years um, you can start to group species based on their level of response and so in a lot of cases the ones that we're listing here are considered uh, ones that are non-target now certainly there's situations where some of these would be targeted weeds but we're able to categorize them if uh, in kind of that one to two range as we've rated it that's more or less little to no activity we do get kind of a spectrum of response and it does go back to that nature 
of the ALS chemistry, but you can see a really nice uh, group of, of desirable non-targets falling in that acceptable range. And then occasionally, like on some of these others, we do know that there's some that might be desirable in some cases, or maybe even a target weed, and we start to see that more in the uh, two, three, and four range of response, where we're starting to see more growth reduction and, uh, you know, getting into the range of control. But Dan, this was always an important one to me of when you really start to separate trade winds, say, from a product like Sonar. Great material for a lot of different things. But again, the list of selectivity here was always impressive to me with with, with trade wind. Uh, things like coontail and valcinaria, uh, you know, really important weeds that you want to a lot of times have little to no effect, uh, but still have the ability to to target a few really important weeds, which trade wind does. And, you know, one of the interesting things, if you look here, the fragrant water lilies, we showed the pictures where it was kind of removed, but still a two to four. So that gives you a, even a better feeling that these things that we've listed, especially ones and twos, has, has certainly a very little uh, response um, when you start to look at an application of, of trade wind. Yeah, and this really does address, I think, kind of the changing nature of aquatic plant management. Uh, certainly more targeted applications and and greater concern for you know kind of the fishery habitats as well maybe moving from a you know a drainage sort of approach and and things like that so it really does fit some of the uh, the key objectives of a lot of the uh, lake pond and aquatic plant managers that that we're working with so let's let's move we kind of talked a little bit about you know chemistry uh, what kind of weeds as well as what kind of non-target response we're seeing. So let's get to maybe a little bit of the logistics or nuts and bolts of the application guidelines here, Jason, on trade wind. If you want to walk us through just kind of general use use patterns and, and your observations on how this uh, plays itself out with the commercial applicators. Well, the, one of the things too, I'll say, Dan, right up front with trade wind, I think the ease of application has always came, came to mind. Uh, first, I'll talk about the subsurface applications. Again, um, trade wind being an active ingredient that's extremely water soluble. Um, you know, a lot of times we make our applications just on water soluble packets uh, based on the rate we want per acre foot. We make those applications and knowing that this material is going to easily spread itself out through a, a large water body. Uh, so we have the subsurface a application. Mostly, you know, we're at 30 to 45 part per million has been the uh, ideal application rate. And, and again, we'll show some more information on that, but that's kind of always been the target rate. Um, there are some circumstances where you could go at a little bit lower rate. Again, those surface applications. Uh, again, we're, here we're targeting one to two ounces per surface acre. Uh, you know, add a surfactant, try to get good coverage and, and use the material in that direction. And then the last part I, I think that's important is, yes, you can make sequential applications, uh, but a lot of times we haven't gone that route of making bump applications, say even for with subsurface applications. A lot of times with, with the characteristics that are provided by Bisperabac and Tradewind, um, we make generally single applications. And this has led to really some, some nice applications when it comes to aerial applications as well, and those surface sprays where you can make a single application over a large body of water. Um, sometimes it might be hard to reach or something of that nature. Some of these aerial uh, situations where it's, it's worked really well for people. So a lot of flexibility, uh, I think overall, Dan, is probably the best way to describe it with trade wind is the technique has, is really quite, uh, quite open. It, you don't yeah. have to be so tied into getting, say, this perfect coverage. You're, you just have a really flexible active ingredient here. Yeah, that low rate coupled with water solubility as we look at the picture of the of the airboat thinking about you know there's a lot of uh, labor that comes into play particularly if you've got to you know get the drop tubes out and you know cover a body of water back and forth at least with the uh, the low use rate as well as the water solubility that uh, maybe cuts down on the amount of labor and getting getting things applied so Kind of jump in into we we've hit a little bit on that uh, on that rate range, but maybe talk a little bit more as to, and we'll get to hydrilla as well. But just kind of that subsurface application rate, and you know, uh, there's a pretty good range there. So maybe talk a little bit of, of what you've seen there, Jason, on yeah. kind of targeting rates and maybe species specific too, if you would. 
Yeah, I was going to say there's, uh, you know, a lot of flexibility, but you stop and think about it. Okay, it's 20 to 45 part per billion is what's on the label for some of these subsurface applications. Um, I'll even say I've had a lot of success through the years with using trade one, even in smaller enclosure pods um, to where you can even make shoreline applications, just tossing out the packets into the water, knowing that, again, this material is going to get throughout that water body. Water body. And uh, I, I, my preference through the years has always been, again, 30 to 45 part per billion with a lot of cases, 45 part per billion. And reason being, uh, a lot of people that I've tended to work with had overall some pretty heavy biomass in there, Dan. Um, I, I do think that what you'll find is that if you have really high bi biomass, um, I think you're going to see the benefits of going to a little bit higher rate. One of the things we talked about is how the how this herbicide actually can get pulled into the plants at the snake. I think you do start to see a drop in concentration, which would make sense if a lot of it's getting pulled into the plants rather quickly with some of these subsurface applications. So if you start a little bit on the higher range, uh, knowing that a little bit lower quantity then is going to be spread throughout that water body and maintained as a concentration in that water body, uh, especially with something like hydrilla, I think is is a, is a value. Um, and yeah, well, repeat it. Yeah, let's let's jump to uh, to hydrilla here, Jason, as we're talking about it. Yeah, um, kind of what you've seen as far as targeting those rates and and maybe a little bit on the tank mixes there too. Yeah, I think thirty to forty five is really kind of gets us in our wheelhouse. Uh, I know we're going to show some pictures here in the next couple slides, so I'll talk about you know some combinations. So one of the combinations we probably had the most success with is endothol, one part per million, so a rather low rate of endothol. Uh, it seems like at this point in time, you have two things. One, you have resistance management, right? You have two different modes of action going at once. So you have some other chemistry with endothol that's a little faster acting, doesn't last quite as long, but will be in the water body a lot of times for what we'll say around seven days. So you kind of get some benefits of a little bit quicker, a longer with, with the longer lasting trade wind. So that's the reason I kind of like that uh, combination. Again, lowering the rate of, of trade wind down to 30 part per million, adding some endothol kind of coming at it from two different directions so especially in cases where you have some really thick dense hydrilla that combination dan has been one that's worked well but again uh i think if we go into some of the maybe the the other uh slides here we'll we'll uh, show some some good results even with trade wind applied alone in some of these settings you bet well we'll we'll get to this oh. uh some of the hydrilla applications but um, just a couple of things as we're working through the, you know, general use patterns here. You know, one of the things that's, you know, real favorable as far as trade wind, again, for these aquatic environments, a lot of questions certainly come up is, you know, what is uh, what is the drinking and recreational uh, uh, restrictions? And so, as you can see there, uh, no post-application restrictions against those. And then also on the irrigation language, as we know, in a lot of the southern uh, aquatics markets that uh, some of these ponds will be, uh, the water will be used for irrigation of Bermuda grass in St. Augustine. So we've got a good allowance and kind of testing there as well to kind of fit fit those uses. Of other things too, you know, just walking through the the, the overall formulation and, and use pattern here, we've got, uh, you know, favorable PPE uh, requirements, just simply gloves. Uh, long sleeve shirt and pants, shoes and socks, hopefully, <laughs> which, which is pretty standard. One of the things too that's uh, kind of given us a, a, a chance to to maybe uh, remind customers about Tradewind is one of the things that uh, we hear a lot of times is that the just the packaging really has been uh, kind of targeted towards some of the larger lakes, which obviously Tradewind fits really well in, but coming in 2020, and 21 is uh, some smaller pack sizes to really address maybe some of the pond guys that you're talking about, you know, where they're needing to maybe just get a couple of packets per pond. And so, you know, historically we've been looking at almost a, a case treating up to 80 acres at a two ounce um, per acre rate. And so with the smaller pack size um, with a two ounce pouch, as opposed to the eight ounce pouch, we'll have just two and a half pounds. So basically we're looking at a 20 acre uh, uh, pack size here coming forward with the new cases here at, at the end of 2020 and into 21. So I think that'll be really favorable too, to kind of hit some of those smaller applicators that you were talking about there, Jason. Oh, absolutely, Dan. I think that that's really going to change some of that uh, ability to go into some of those smaller uh, pond markets. And 
Um, I, I know we've been bouncing around a little bit, but one of the things that I did want to mention is, you know, the ability for some of the spectrum that we've seen in some of these smaller ponds as well. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind, um, two of the really common weeds are duckweed and watermeal, right? We have duckweed on the label as a foliar spray, but watermeal, I will say, is very sensitive as well to some of these submersed application rates. So you go into some of these ponds and you can really even get some of the more common um, weeds that you're gonna encounter um, as, as well. So just something to, to, to kind of keep in mind when it comes to trade wind is the ability to, to control surface weeds even with these submersed application rates. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's one of the things we've learned is this product has been on the market for a number of years. As, you know, so much of the work was, you know, really honed in on that key weed of hydrilla, but uh, the characteristics certainly take it well beyond, you know, the large lake treatments of uh, for hydrilla. So, back to the back to the world of hydrilla, though, we've we've seen some really neat field results, and I wanted you to walk through a couple of uh, a couple of examples during its development in, uh, uh, you know, some of the earlier years when Tradewind was being uh, vetted, so to speak. So let's walk through a couple of these examples on hydrilla down in Florida. And I know you you had a integral part in getting these things established and tracking the, the development. So let's talk about these here, Jason. Yeah, this was one that uh, we had the ability to work with uh, Dr. Haller and Dr. Mudge um, when they were at the University of Florida. Uh, this was an application that was in early April. As you can see, this picture was taken on April 3rd, uh, three days after that application. And you can see the hydrilla is already starting to have a little bit of off coloring to it. So uh, just a couple of days after that application, 45 part, uh, part per billion application of, of trade win in this case. Um, this was one that, again, I was I was down for the these pictures when they were taken. Uh, so really uh, impressed with this whole site. This is, uh, again, at Interlock in Florida. Um, but moving now into to two months after that application, again, a single 45 part per million to trade one by itself, uh, two months after that application, you can start to see, you know, not only had some yellowing just a couple of days after that application, but by two months, it's really starting to turn into mush. When you would throw the rakes out, bring in samples, uh, that hydrilla was in a sense dead. It just didn't quite know it yet. Uh, again, kind of what I was talking about as far as that slow sort of decay, and by four months after the application, you would throw rake after rake out and, and just bring something up like this to where, you know, this had really completely cleaned up uh, the hydrilla in this case, Dan. So we're yeah. looking at an application, you know, four months after that. So really, Dan, I, you know, I, I thought this was ideal. Uh, again, this was an application that was made in, in early first of September or excuse me, first of April. And then we're looking in uh, really throughout the year here into September. Yeah, so this next example here, uh, we kind of go from one of those retention ponds, kind of the one of those initial tests to some of the initial lake applications. So I, I thought this Thomas Lake example was really pulled together a lot of the characteristics of trade wind, particularly on not only on control, but uh, selectivity. So why don't you walk us through this particular one? Yeah, it was real good, Dan, to, to point that out. The difference of the, some of those uh, retention ponds versus here we're looking at a nine foot average depth. So a 75 acre lake, so a large lake. 45 part per million to trade wind by itself. Uh, nice mixture. And this application was made a little later. So this was a summer. This was July 22nd. And uh, they had uh, a fair amount of naiad you'll find, but also really wanted to monitor their cattail uh, as well as their lotus and uh, just see exactly what happened to those uh, species along the way as well. So uh, here's a picture at application day. You can see most of what we're looking at is hydrilla. There is a little bit of naiad there. Uh, again, the goal of this application was save our naiad, remove as much hydrilla as possible. So we went out at the high rate uh, and really had some nice, uh, nice data to go with not only the visual observations, but some good hard data. And this data here that what we're looking at is uh, pre-treatment biomass numbers. Uh, this was taken on July 20th, so right before the application. And the key number that I've always focused, Dan, on this one is that hydrilla. When you look at it, overall, when they took these, these transect samples, and there was nine of them total, the average was 22 grams of dry weight of hydrilla and overall seven grams of NIAD. So, and you had a, a bio volume of 61%. So 61%, there was something in there as far as plant material, 22 grams of that would have been hydrilla, seven grams of that would have been the naiad. 
And if you come back then onto the next slide, which was on October 20th, three months after that application, our hydrilla has dropped down to two grams and our NIADS now started at seven up to nine grams with just 9% percent, uh, bio volume in there. So when you take a look at these numbers, what did we do? We've almost completely removed our hydrilla and actually increased the amount of NIAD in there. And just really impressive to take a look at those numbers. You know, we dropped that bio volume from 61 down to 9%. So we've taken the weeds out of the water column really selectively in this case. And, you know, that's just on those two weeds. I think if we look at the next picture, uh, Dan, it kind of gives a really good indication of, of what we were looking at. Again, we've taken so much of that biomass out of the water body in the hydrilla in this Th Thomas Lake, uh, but still minimal impact on a lot of floatings. We see some of our water lilies here. Again, our spatter dock is okay. Cattails are okay. A lot of the, the material that they were really wanting for fish habitat and for, for other reasons around the lake at three months after application, uh, we're still there, still thriving, still doing quite yeah, that's well. That's really uh, interesting. So back, yeah, back to our southern naiad. There we are with the the rake pole at three months. Yeah, um, it was awfully easy at this point in time to to find your naiad out there, Dan. Yeah, and if, for those of you in the aquatic world, when you're dragging a rake and pulling up. Uh, fully grown hydrilla it's much easier to pull naiad than than hydrilla that's for sure so i've got here the the uh, sampling of the bear back you know we started off talking about chemistry but you know maybe tie these two things together and what you saw on on the the residues throughout the the sampling dates well dan i i think this is one where it was important again starting at 45 part per billion you can see the the concentrations overall started up, up and then dropped but if you take a look you know this was july 22nd even go out there to like three, four months out, you know, into November, we're still close to 30 part per billion. So we maintained a, a fairly high concentration, a concentration high enough to continue to work on our on our hydrilla. But like you mentioned earlier, one of the interesting things is the weeds that can really metabolize and break this active ingredient down, even if exposed for several months, four months, still can survive the, the exposure. So it's really interesting and, and unique chemistry in that way. Yeah, it sure is. And the uh, the results at, at uh, Thomas Lake that you've got here, you know, we showed the, the symptoms at one month, uh, the biomass reduction without the impact on the NIAD. That's uh, that's really interesting. There's a bullet point here that that uh, sprouts collected at seven months with not growing a lab. So talk a little bit about, you know, you can pull the rakes, but, you know, there's still some things you can pull up. Talk, talk about that. Yeah. The, you know, that was one of the side benefits that I think even Dr. Heller didn't necessarily expect. You know, most of the time when you see herbicide applications, yes, you can knock down your hydrilla, but long term, you know, the, those turions are still there. They're still viable. But in this case, when he was collecting them at seven, seven months, trying to grow them out, they 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 were not growing, Dan. Um, again, some real uniqueness that I think is important and in, in things that we can take advantage of with those product like trade wind, especially because of how long it's long lived it was, especially in this case, keeping those concentrations up with a single app and not only removing what was there, but also having an effect potentially long term in cleaning up this lake. Yeah, fantastic. Um, you know, we've we've hit a little bit on on some other weeds, uh, the floating weeds as we move from, you know, the really uh, great results on hydrilla. But you touched on a few of these uh, throughout today, Jason. You know, the floating weeds like water hyacinth, the water lettuce, salvinia. Uh, you mentioned uh, water meal as well. So, you know, one of the things that we'll get asked a lot is, okay, we, we understand kind of the slow activity, gradual activity of trade wind in the water. But are there times when, when tank mixes have been effective? And can you maybe walk through a few of these? Because I know not every tank mix is suitable across all weeds. Yeah, and and I'll say that right up front. You know, uh, Clipper has is, has been a, a tremendous you know asset to the whole aquatics industry. Can do a lot of things with with that uh, product. And a combination of trade one with Clipper, you know, for hydrilla is not necessarily my my favorite. Uh, you see rather uh, quick activity with Clipper, but just isn't translocated enough to really help uh, in a lot of cases with trade wind when it comes to hydrilla. But when it comes to that combination 
and making applications on on water hyacinth, water lo- lettuce, and, and sylvinia, those three weeds in particular, I see some real benefits, Dan, from the combination of, of clipper with trade wind. Uh, a lot of times I still stay at two uh, ounces per surface acre of trade wind uh, with clipper. A lot of times we're looking at, uh, oh, a lot of times we're, we're going out at like eight ounces per surface acres with the combination, uh, maybe even a little bit lower in some cases. Sometimes we're even down at two to four. Uh, a lot of flexibility there depending on what you're looking for. But again, two modes of action. Uh, we're coming at it from from really as a weed science benefits of, of putting two different things together, one that's rather fast acting, one that's rather slow and kind of getting the best of both worlds. Yeah, I talked a little bit. You mentioned water meal. I know that that was a a great breakthrough for the industry when uh, when Clipper came out. So talk, and you also mentioned Tradewinds activity. Have you seen those two together on on Watermill, uh, uh, duckweed as well? Some of those that that have traditionally yeah. been a little trickier to control. Absolutely, and and you know that has been a, a key finding for us over the last even just couple of years is the combination of Clipper with Tradewind in small ponds, especially when they're targeting. Um, water meal and duckweed, right? The water level maintains, you know, at one level at application, if it drops or if it, it goes up and then drops back down, a lot of times you'll find those weeds hanging along the shoreline, just waiting for that level to go back up so they can reinvest that water. I mean, a very short acting product like Clipper, you know, I tell people here today, gone tomorrow, 24 hours, it's out of the water column, that if you have trade wind in there, that you can maintain control really of those two weeds, in a lot of cases, all season long with just a single application, whereas with Clipper, it might take two or three applications throughout the season, Dan. So really, I love that combination when you're targeting things like water meal and duckweed. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one. And, you know, if, it, if you get calls in the Midwest, it seems to be that's one of the two weeds you generally get asked about. So that's great recommendation. It's interesting to hear even there were a few years, uh, you know, post launch on trade trade when we're still learning how to how to utilize it and utilize some of those benefits that we've talked about throughout to to address some of the more challenging environments such as the you know changing water levels in a small pond with duckweed and and water meal. So that's uh, that's exciting. You know, it's a product that's uh, uh, maybe initially targeted towards hydrilla, but we continue to find ways that it brings a lot of value to uh, to customers and aquatic plant managers. So, Jason, I'm going to try to wrap up here today, just a, a wealth of knowledge, and I appreciate your uh, your expertise and sharing that with, with uh, myself and those of us listening along on this webinar series. So, you know, with Tradewind, uh, this bisperibac sodium is really unique chemistry. Uh, that ALS uh, group of products have a lot of unique attributes, and this one is really well suited for aquatic use. The, the flexibility and ease of use is one thing that I've certainly heard uh, today, time and again, having a flexible product with a low use rate and, and a low impact on many desirables, and that's that's really interesting. Why why we may think of this as a as a large lake hydrilla product, we're knowing we're seeing that it's effective on a lot of other uh, key aquatic weeds, as we mentioned, not just the submerged weeds, but some of the more challenging floating weeds as well. Um, you know, those use rates really lend themselves to maybe the smaller applicators that are targeting some smaller bodies of water. And we've got the new pack size to address that as well. You know, one of the things that you hit on early too is uh, that that uh, trade wind chemistry has high solubility. So again, thinking of maybe smaller ponds that might have some uh, turbidity that it's going to, uh, it's not going to bind up with the solids and it's going to mix and disperse well in sites that uh, maybe it's a little trickier to, to navigate or get a boat on or things like that. So just really neat chemistry when it comes to uh, having a lot of value and a lot of flexibility. You know, we didn't touch on this as well, but having another tool like Tradewind uh, does bring uh, an important piece of resistance management and uh, knowing that there's not a, a lot of products that are registered for use in aquatic environments. So I think it's important to remember Tradewind also as a resistance management tool. So again, Jason, really appreciate your time and uh, sharing your experiences. Uh, any last words here before I wrap things up? Well, I just want to thank you, Dan. And, uh, you know, I think you've just hit all the key points here. I mean, it's just a very flexible product that, you know, I just uh, always remind people of, of some of the characteristics we just talked about and say, just get out and try it in some areas. I think you'll really like what you see. Well, couldn't say it better myself. Jason, thanks again. Uh, just as I wrap things up, 
Um, if you do have other aquatic questions, certainly feel to, free to reach out to us at New Farm. We just touched on one of them here today with Tradewind, but obviously we have a full portfolio of aquatic herbicides ranging from Tradewind to Clipper Depth Charge, uh, Polaris for you know Emerge and Shoreline Weeds. We've got standards like Weed R64, uh, Tahoe 3A with Triclopyr, as well as combinations and uh, you know traditional products like Diquat as well. So again, uh, thank you for joining us here today. If you have any questions, further questions on Tradewind or any of our aquatic herbicides, feel free to reach out to New Farm and uh, we'll be happy to help you. Thanks again.